the arts, it's not just dance, the yeah. art is, mm-hmm. it should be available for every young person. And, and it should be, doesn't matter the color of your skin, your background, your, your social standing. If it's there and a child wishes to go into that space, let them go. Because that's how you find yourself. I found myself through the dance. I found myself by exploring my creativity and my artistry then. You know, I found out who I was very early because of the dance. You know, by the age of seven, I knew that was it. This is what I want to do. Petra, can you hear me? I can hear you, Dolly. It's it's so great to meet you here on Zoom. Likewise, likewise. Good to put a face, a real face rather than a picture. To, to... Yeah. <laughs> and what what a beautiful setting you have. I mean, wow. Oh. It's lovely. It's yeah. home. Just home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it feels very homely. Well, it will, be like, it will be like having a coffee with you at your home. I have it here. Oh, ah, perfect. <laughs> it's still yeah, 10 o'clock. I'm, I mean, although I've been up for a while, yeah, this is the first coffee of the day. So hopefully oh, okay. not, otherwise I'll be wired. So, yeah, <laughs> having it with you. so lovely. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you. This is really special. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. But as a dancer, you're talking about your 10 o'clock coffee, but as a dancer, um, I know you 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 guys just get on with it, isn't it? I mean, you you perform till late at night and next morning back in the well, studio uh, and just yeah. going. Totally, totally. And if you're not in the studio, you're working on something else. And I suppose in many ways, I think as self-employed uh, artists and people who work for yourself, when you're working for yourself, your time is your time. So you have to make the most of your time. And I'm I've never been one to really sit still. Uh, oh, really? from, yeah. from a child I mean if I remember my parents saying you never sat still you need to sit still and it's kind of wasn't part of my uh vocabulary or my my <laughs> yeah. I was always uh, always with energy and always moving and needed to be somewhere or do something or make something happen and I think as a creative artist you're constantly yeah. on on the lookout what needs to be done what can I do mm-hmm. so yeah I think yeah yeah it but worked. You're, yeah, you're based in London. I am. Yeah. I and am. Are you originally from London? Did you grow up there? I didn't grow up in London, actually. People laugh when I tell them because I'm actually a country girl. I'm not a city girl really? at all. Really? Um, I grew up in a, a, a place in the West Country called uh, Bridgewater, Somerset, which is where they make the sign and the cheddar yeah. cheese. Yeah. And yeah. That's a long time ago. And then I actually was, I went to school and I grew up, grew up in a place called Northamptonshire. So okay. I'm really a country girl. I, I just remember outside my bedroom, there being a field with cows and sheep and yeah. Well, and- Dolly, the reason why I get so excited is because I used to live in Taunton. I lived in Taunton oh, for seven years. Yeah. No. And Bridgewater is the neighboring. Absolutely. So I know exactly. Yeah. I know exactly. Oh, that's. My goodness! Yeah. The world. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I know exactly what you're saying, and you I also under- I understand what a huge step London is from Bridgewater. I mean, absolutely, because yeah. well, for me per se, I'm I'm talking about now. I'm talking about ethnicity. You know, there were no black people in the '60s living in 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 Bridgewater, Somerset. So I think we were the only family, only family really? living there. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, at that time in the sixties, I was born in sixty two, um, and and then when we moved to Northampton, when I was three and a half, I think we, I was three and a half. Again, I mean, I'm not being snobby or anything. We were kind of a middle class black family, so we lived in residential areas and you know we were always the only black family and we were always the only blacks and we <laughs> and really? that's, oh yeah yeah so I I'm you know my husband is from Brixton London 
Mm-hmm. I mean, he's white, he's from Brixton, and I'm we we laugh together. We talk about the difference in our upbringing and how we lived, and he goes, you're so middle class. And I go, yeah, I know. You know, <laughs> so we joke about it, but in the reality, yeah. it was very rare. I suppose it was very rare at that time and coming mm-hmm. through. So yeah, I've had I've had the luxury of both worlds, to be quite honest. Yeah. I think, you know, for me, arts has always been a place where actually all of that has to you have to kind of get rid of all yeah. of it. You know, you yeah. have to, you know, I've I wouldn't say it's been easy, but it hasn't been, you know, it hasn't been easy, but yeah. it hasn't been difficult either. I think I'm you know, my family and the way my parents brought me up was that this is where you want to be, you be there. And yeah. this is what you want to do, you do that. Get on just, with it, yeah. Yeah, just mm-hmm. remember that you may have difficulties because of the colour of your skin. You may have to work three or four times harder than most people because of that, but that shouldn't deter you. And, I, have, I'm, you know, I was very, very, very lucky that I had parents who were always supportive of whatever I wanted to do and always behind me and, you know, would tell me, yes, you can, and would say, no, you need to do more. So it, I got it from the home that, you know, whatever you put your mind to, you can exactly. achieve. Yeah, yeah. And, and and there will be difficulties along the way, and you have to accept that everybody's not you. Exactly. But <laughs> you, but it's, it's almost like a double whammy then because um, uh, the dance world itself is not an easy world to be in, you know, and – and I know in ballet, it's it's very difficult and you're very much scrutinized, you know, well, from every, scrutinized from every for their angle. physique. Yeah. And every just, angle. No, it's yeah, true. Yeah. I mean, I started off as a classical dancer. I at the age of I started dancing at the age of four and a half. And all I knew was ballet. And my dream was to be the first black British ballerina. So, you know, and all along the way, I was told. No, no, no. But it didn't deter me. What it did do is made me more determined to make it happen and more so to make it happen in a way that it would work for me. It was about me. I I realised that I was living in a time, as I said, in an era and a time where black ballerinas did not exist, particularly in England. That was just a kind of a no-no. If I wanted to do something like that, I would definitely have to go to America where there was possibly a chance where I could veer that way. But in many ways, you know, I, I don't regret not having a ballet career or a classical career because I know the technique that I, I learned and all the exams that I took in Royal Ballet and all of those, they've st- stood me well. You know, they're yeah. backbone to my technique of everything that I've ever done So and everything that I do. So, you know, I, I feel quite blessed that I've had that really deep, done, really deep, healthy uh, relationship with the ballet world. Healthy from my point of view. Others may not have seen it as healthy and didn't want me to be part of it, but that didn't really matter because I was going to spring off and do other things anyway. So, But, but it's also, uh, you know, there are many... Uh, because I thought about that and I was, uh, when I also read about all the wonderful things you are doing um, and that you've done. And I think uh, I remember also my children in, in the ballet uh, school and, and so on. There's just one set look, yeah, line, yeah. And look, and it's like you have to do it this way and you have to go to this school and this is the best. And and I look at you and you you've done everything and you've you've you love what you're doing and I can see and you've also get got the recognition for it. Um, and you wish that these girls that that go through all the lengths just to be try and be the perfect little dancer has this vision of look what's out there in the dance world. I think that and that, again, that goes back to my parents. I think the world was my oyster, as they used to say. You can be whatever you want. You don't have to stick there. And I think because I trod the boards, not just as a classical dancer, but I trod the boards with tap and modern and jazz and vocals and drama, it it kind of opens up the platform for you. You're not subjugated to being one style or one thing. And I know the industry is very much about putting people in boxes. And I was kind of that kind of young person who said, you're not going to put me in a box. You're going to accept me for who I am, what I am, all the things that I can do. I did have agents like that. I have to say, you know, in my early career who wanted to 
put me in a box and say, well, this is what you do. And I go, but actually, no, but I do this as well. And I do that. And actually what I'm termed as is a triple threater. So I can dance, I can sing, I can act. You know, I already knew I could choreograph, but that was something that came later. Um, you know, because my my vision was never, never blinkered. I didn't have a blinkered vision of what it was to be an artist or a performer or even a dancer, you know. And I've always said to this day, I was never just a dancer. I was a creative artist who could dance. I was oh, yeah. a creative artist who could act, who could sing. So I never called myself a dancer. And I think once you just pigeon yourself into what everybody else wants you to be, that's what you end up being. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, no, exactly. So. I love what you're telling now. And, you know, it's exactly. And this is exactly what children should hear. Um, and, and I think it's. It's so important. I, I, I wanted to ask you also this question. Do you think um, there's not enough emphasis on, on the fact that dance really is such a great art form and so important for children to be part of? I don't know who and where I would be without the dance. I honestly do not know. I... I don't know anything else. So because I don't know anything else, I, you know, the answer for me is the arts. It's not just dance. The yeah. art mm -hmm. is it should be available for every young person. And, and it should be, doesn't matter the color of your skin, your background, your, your social standing. If it's there and a child wishes to go into that space, let them go. Because that's how you find yourself. I found myself through the dance. I found myself by exploring my creativity and my artistry then. You know, I found out who I was very early because of the dance. You know, by the age of seven, I knew that was it. This is what I want to do. You know, and I, where could I go at that time in my life? You know, again, this was the late 60s, you know, and, you know, barriers were being put in front of me already. Yeah. But it was the dance that allowed me to escape, you know, and I and I, I do think, you know, we're, sadly, we're in a situation, I don't know what it's like in Germany, but definitely here in the UK, a lot of the arts has been stifled. The money's been taken out. The government have removed everything. It's not in schools saw, in the yeah. same way at the moment. And, you know, it's so sad because many of us come through those gates and those doors that allow us to pursue careers that we probably wouldn't wouldn't even be thinking of. Mm -hmm. And but it's not in, even a career. I think to be artistic and to find an artistic expression works through all what we do, whether you yeah. work in an office, whether you work in the bank, whether you, you know what I mean? It's, exactly. it, it, it serves a purpose to explore yourself. And I think that's what art is meant to do. You're meant to find yourself through art. You can go and get a job and earn money. That's one thing. But actually, actually, art doesn't matter. As I say, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, what your background is, what your color is or whatever. It's a way of expression. So for me, it's so important that we allow that to happen from exactly. a very early age, from a very yeah. early age, the earlier, I, the better. Exactly. I think so, too. And, and uh, this is really my wish that I think every child should have the opportunity to be taught some form of art alongside science and maths and Absolutely. languages. Absolutely. And um, there's definitely a link between all these uh, disciplines and it should be taught that way, you know. And it's sad for me that art has become a side subject and a side, um, you know, this one hour a week or half an hour a week type of subject. Sometimes it's not even that, you know, that's the sad mm -hmm. thing. And, you know, we're expected to do it outside our school hours, but it should be part of the curriculum as it used to be. I mean, if I yeah. remember, I had dance at school. That was part, instead of PE, you could have dance or you could have, you know, you could have your PE and your sports, but there was always dance. There was always drama. There was always music. You know, and that's what I'm saying. There were so many of us who maybe didn't go on to have the career, but were exactly. better, but were better people for having that introduction to the arts. You know, and yeah, I I I feel sad that it's you know in this day and age in the 21st century we've kind of gone backwards. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's marginalising people's ability to be who they want to be. You know, exactly. the struggle, and I think that has a lot to do with. 
you know, it's a lot of depression that's going on, a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of young people now who are disaffected. And I think it's because they haven't been allowed to find their way through less academic uh, streams, Absolutely. but more artistic streams, you know, because not everybody's academic. You know, exactly. I, I was lucky I could do both. You know, I was quite good at English and I was terrible at maths, but English was great and did it, and I could tell a good story and I could write. And so I was OK, you know, chemistry, biology. I loved all of those things, but I knew I was never going to work in that area. Yeah, it, it was, you know, it was just there because I had to get my exams at the end of the day. Yeah, but it was, you know, it, I, I remember getting into Lane Theatre Arts when I was 15 and I still had a year to go before I left school. So for me, because I knew I was going to, to college, performing arts college, it kind of gave me that, OK, just do as much as you can, doll, because in a year's time, you're going to be in Epsom doing what you really want to do full time. You know, mm -hmm. so it, yeah, I, yeah. For me, I think the arts is a, a gateway. It's a gateway for normal, normality, actually, a little yeah. bit of normality in our life and not having to worry about the pounds, shillings and pence, you know, the, the the strains of life that we're all put under. You have to earn a living. You have to earn a living. Actually, you can earn a living through being an artist. You can. Exactly. You can. And, and also that all the skills that come with pursuing an art it can make you the best um, scientist or it can make Absolutely. you, you know, a banker or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah, It's all connected. Yeah. Artistry runs through everything. I have an, I often say to people in other meetings or, or talks that I have, you know, we were born out of creativity. Two people coming together, creating, that's, we are born out of that. So why are we stopping that from happening in its natural, natural sense? We have, you know, we can be a painter, you know, somebody can be doodling. That is artistic. Yeah. You know, somebody can be standing in their kitchen, listening to a piece of music and just twirl. That is artistic. It may not be at the top end, but it's still artistic and it shouldn't be poo-pooed. You know exactly. I mean? it no, be. but it's it's true. And if you look at if you look at the time we were all in lockdown, what did people start doing? They started cooking. They started baking. They started knitting. All they started artistic, painting. There's all, like, all, all know? things. All yeah. artistic things. All the things that you don't have time to do exactly. normally. Yes. You yeah. know, you know, all right, for me, uh, lockdown was quite incredible because actually it did make my mind go, OK, what am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? And so I, you know, I, I made a bop shop and I, I set up classes online. So I still kept myself creative, not in the same way as I would be if I was in a studio. I rehearsed the company online. You know, my front room, this room became a studio and it was you know, in fact, I, I I actually thought, wow, actually, we need we don't need more lockdown. That's not what I'm no, saying. No, but the time, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the time to do things that you wouldn't normally yeah. do. You know, we rearranged the garden. We did. Exactly. All, you know, I really tended to the flowers in my garden and, and redesigned the garden. So I got creative with that. You know, we, we didn't paint, but, you know, we tidied up a lot. It was wonderful. Yeah. And actually, I just thought, wow, you know, yeah. horrible as it was and for the reasons that we had to lock down, which were hideous and so scary. But at the, at the end of the day, we could have either sat in the scariness, which I didn't want to do, mm. or do something proactive. So we did the proactive thing. And yeah. that's what I'm saying. As artists and as human beings, we want to find ways of ah, breathing. Exactly. And, you know, I spoke to, a, a, you, I don't know if you know Laura Day. She's a dancer at Birmingham. <laughs> yeah, you know, Laura. Um, I spoke to her as well during lockdown and she said, you know, what's so amazing, she went on a balcony and just uh, looked at the bee, you know, just yeah, it's it's so wonderful, the bee. Yeah. And I thought how, uh, because I know, you know, in, in the dance world and with them, you know, it's full on every day and it's like, and I, I can imagine you don't notice that anymore. But then there was the time for people to notice these little things, you know. Listen, it was the beautiful thing was listening to the birds in the morning. Yeah. Stuff, you know, those simple little things. So I get that because we would go, my husband and I would go for walks around our area. And mm. we're kind of in Sutton, sorry. So it's quite green and, you, you know, there's a lot of greenery around and there's a little park not far from here. And we go and walk and we keep ourselves ourselves, but we just sit on the bench and listen. Listen to nature. 
And sometimes there was nothing and because there were no cars or buses or yeah. even planes. It was just, wow. And mm. it, it was kind of beautiful silence, if that makes sense. Yeah. It was a beautiful silence, but you could really hear nature. Mm. And it was like, wow, you know, we really don't know what we're missing out on. Actually, we need to stop. And I, for me, it was good. I I found it second lockdown, third lockdown. Okay, first yeah. lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> like, but, okay, this needs to stop now. But yeah. You know, yeah, but I photographed five hundred artists here in Vienna in their windows during lockdown, and I spoke oh, wow. to all of them. And and I I was expecting people to be really depressed, but they weren't. You know, they were like, okay, yes. I mean, there were things that that were you know, sad and, and yeah, roles they missed and, and financial things. Sure. But then the, the next breath they would say, but actually, you know, we have time to to do, you know, pianists would say, I have time to play a repertoire that I've otherwise don't have time to do. And, and everybody would have something that they started doing. That My they husband did. did the same thing. He got into the street because we have a home studio. His, his studio is here at home. And, you know, it was we were writing music, we were recording, you know, because I still sing a little bit. So we were doing some recording with voices, but he was writing some music for our next project. And it was so nice. And the other thing that we found is that we spent time together. We rekindled our relationship. You know, we've been together for 26 years, but at that time it was like he'd go to off to the studio or to the recording and I'd be off in the studio or... We wouldn't, we were ships in the night. And all of a sudden yeah. we had all this time together and it was beautiful because we kind of rekindled our relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to know each other again rather than passing by. Bye, darling. It was, you yeah. know, spending yeah. quality time together, mm -hmm. which was great. So, yeah, yeah. I, you know, COVID, COVID was a difficult time and I know coming out of it, it's been difficult for people. Touch yeah. wood, I'm, touch wood, I'm being okay. <laughs> touch yeah. wood, would everything's okay, you know. Yeah. But I know a lot of no, people. It was definitely, yeah, uh, uh, there are many positive things. But Dolly, tell me about this um, Bob, uh, uh, Bob, body of people. It's it's My your baby. company. It's your um, dance company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I founded the company in uh, 1996. It, and the reason why it came across, uh, came to be to be quite honest was because there was no other jazz theatre company in the country and I'd spent many of many a year looking for somewhere where I could go and be a performer with a, a jazz theatre company or create and just wasn't existing it didn't exist in our modern day what I call modern day and I'd always had a dream from when I was 17 one day I'm going to have a company and I remember telling Betty Lane at Lane Theatre Art she asked me one day what are you going to do and I said I'm going to have my own company really? and, she at me. and I was 17 when I said that so for me it was kind of I've always been a person, Petra, that if I put my mind to something, it's going to happen. And I've always been like that. So it came in 19, 1995 was when the spark happened. And I remember sitting in here and I was with some jazz musician friends, actually. And we were talking and chatting and I was going, I'm going to start a company. I'm going to start a company. And I did. A year later, I had founded the company. I'd limited the company. I'd gone and I got it incorporated. And that was it. And I had some money that I had spare that I'd done some other shows and I had this kind of money and I put the money, put my money into the company. I didn't go anywhere else. I didn't go to arts council or anything. I just put my money into it. And then I got commissioned to do um, a performance at the South Bank Centre. And that was the kind of inaugural moment for Bob because I put six dancers and six musicians and but we hang on, hang on. I want to ask you now first. So you you founded this company and then, but did you have to, to because then at that time, they were probably huge companies. So how did you market this company or how did you get this, uh, this I, opportunity? I, think I had a reputation anyway, because I was known oh, in okay. the theatre world. I'd come yeah. out of musical theatre 
I'd been six years in the West End. People knew who I was. People already knew that I choreographed. I'd be in the West End and I'd be choreographing the shows that the the choreographers hadn't done properly. So I'd go, that's not right. Let me fix it. So I was already (laughs) choreographing. I was already a choreographer in my Mm. own right, but I hadn't set the company up. And I knew I, I was 28, actually, because I remember somebody said to me in the West End, why are you stopping, Dolly? And I said, because I can't do both. I can't be a performer and lead a company or tell people that I'm a choreographer now if I'm still being a performer. I was very uh, I was very strict about myself. So around 28, it was around 28. My last musical theatre show was Sophisticated Ladies. Uh, which came over from America, and then we 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 were the original uh, UK cast. And I did that, and I said, okay, after that, there wasn't really anything else I wanted to do in the West End. I wanted to concentrate on being a choreographer. So I kind of spent a few years kind of mastering my style. I opened up cl- – uh, sorry, you're right. I should have gone back to the beginning. I started classes. I started doing open oh, jazz okay. classes to really work my style, to really find out, okay, what is your style then, Dolly? Although you've been choreographing and you've been doing musical theatre, and what is your jazz style? So I started classes at Dance Works, and I opened up a class, and I started with seven dancers. By the time I'd ended there three, four years later, I had 30, 40 people come into the class. Wow. So I kind of knew that I had a penchant for creating but not only that my style was getting recognized people knew my style from my class and that's I I think kind of that was when I realized okay yeah I can really do this and then I worked for a company uh uh it was it was a contemporary company but they used jazz music so they weren't really jazz but they were a contemporary company that used jazz music and I went and I was associate uh, creative director for them and I kind of looked at how the company they did the company I thought well I don't want to stay here because if I stay here I'm going to take over oh, so, okay. <laughs> and I didn't <laughs> want to do that that was not my company I didn't start it wasn't my company but what it did give me was understanding of how to run a company mm-hmm. you know the back the back behind the behind the front yeah. of the stage you know what goes on behind you know marketing uh, uh, you know, meeting people, greeting people, finding out how you get sponsorship, all of those things. So that's what I learned from working with this company. And from that company, somebody saw a piece that I did on the company, uh, which was a Louis Armstrong piece that I did. And it was it was fabulous. And I loved it. And I, but it was hard and it was high tech, highly technical. And the dancers did a great job. And somebody saw that and said to me, oh, we'd like to commission you to do a piece for the South Bank. And that's how that happened. So from that point, that's when I knew, okay, I can start a company. So during that time, I'm thinking, okay, I need. And bot, body of people, I didn't want to be my name. I didn't want the Dolly Henry company. I just, it just, I don't know. My ego. I is, love the name and and body of people. It's great. But body of people yeah. is so important to me because you know, as I said, I sat with some musician friends and I said it's got to be something that I can shorten if I want to. Bop is music. Bop yeah. is jazz. But body of people meant it is a body of people that are exactly. coming, coming together. Yeah. And a lot of people said, oh, why didn't you call it the Dolly Henry Company? I said, "Uh uh-uh, my ego can't cope with that. That is too much. I didn't want my name in front of it because then it would be about me. Yeah. With body of people, it can be about the people then that I bring to this space and we bring, you know. So that's how Bop started. Bop started at the South Bank in 1995 after I did this piece, which was Touches of Miles, I did a piece called Touches of Miles, which was the music of Miles Davis. And I had six musicians playing Miles' music and I had six dancers. I took a a selection of his tunes and I just turned those tunes into dance. And I remember I remember Petra standing at the back of the auditorium watching this piece of work and going, wow. And I I kind of had an out of body experience because it wasn't like it was my work. It was like I was watching something that was like, whoa, what is this? But it was my work. 
And that's kind of the first time I realised that actually, I, yeah, I'm a creative artist. I can do this. I am a create. I'm not just a choreographer. I am a creative artist. And that might sound really egotistical, but you have to believe in yourself at some point. Yeah, but when you said that now, I I think of of the the many composers I speak to, and they actually say the same thing. It's the moment you hand it over and you you have the musicians perform it, then they then they hear it then for the first time the first as time. intended, and that's probably how you see it then as well. Because I I presume when you chore, do choreography, it's in your head the whole time, and then you have to hand it over. And, and and literally, it's like giving birth, you know, and I remember somebody saying to me afterwards, how do you feel? And I said, I'm kind of blown away. I feel like I've just given birth to something. Really? Yeah. You know, really, it felt like I'd given birth to, to something that was a part of me. It was me. And that was the beginning of Bob. And actually, funny, mm -hmm. we are doing the same piece, the piece was half an hour, now it's 45 minutes, now we have pictures of Miles and projections and his voiceover. It's changed, every time we do it, we add and we change and we change and we change and we change. And we're actually doing it in September. It will, we're bringing it back in September, the whole piece. But wow. it's, it's changed mm -hmm. so much, it's, it's grown with me and it's grown with the company and it's become the inaugural piece of the company, Touches of Miles. So that's how Bop started. And and as I say, I was commissioned to do this, this piece, Touches of Miles, and it was for the Arts Council. The Arts Council sponsored it, and it was a, a, a programme called Nubian Steps, and it was about putting, um, highlighting uh, black choreographers in the UK. And that's how it started. That's how Bop started. And since that day, <laughs> it's only now, funnily enough, it's only now that we're now just getting the support from the Arts Council because no one's really ever seen jazz as an art form. Everyone, really? no, 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 no. Uh, if that was the case, I'd be off and flying by now, but it hasn't been the case at all. We have a problem in this country, and I'm talking about the UK, where we see jazz as musical theatre. We see it as a commercialised idea of musical theatre. We don't understand that there is such thing called jazz theatre. Not musical theatre, jazz theatre, the high art end. And my argument and my push and my whole rhetoric for many, many years to, to anyone is that where is the art of jazz? We all look at the commerciality of it and we all think it's a little bit of fun and we trivialise it, but there is an art form that comes of a people and those people happen to be my people. Mm. And if I dare to say it, and I do, do say it a lot, we can't look at the appropriated version of it all the time. We have to go back and we have to look at where did this art form come from? Who are the people that instigated it? Maybe they didn't get the voices out and they didn't get it written down and they because they were the originators of it. But people took that art form and they made it famous in their name. Exactly. But they took it to the commercial entity. They didn't keep it in its artistic entity. So for me, it's about putting jazz in that same place as I often say to people, we have classical dance, we see that as art. We have contemporary dance, we see that as art. There is jazz dance, we need to see that as art as well. You know, and for me, that's, that's what we do. That's what Bop is about. It's about placing jazz above that parapet of commerciality and saying it is an art form. And to do it, you have to be kind of deep about it there is a deepness about it there is Absolutely. a you know yeah. there is a very it's very deep you know and I often say you know I am standing on great shoulders it's not it's not me I'm just one of the I'm a vessel that this thing is coming out of but because but I am literally standing on shoulders that are mighty 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 and they stem right the way back from Africa yeah so I'm not messing with this I'm only trying to keep it moving forward in a way that is not commercialized but can be exploited as commercial commercially as a commercial entity as well so it has two sides jazz it really has and then there's the music and then there's the song and then it, and the layers it's huge it's huge yeah and you 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 know when i speak to jazz musicians or, or classical musicians who play jazz as well it's always this thing it's not it's not so easy you know people think oh it's easy but 
for a classical mu musician, it's sometimes difficult because that improvisation is not, uh, you know, it doesn't come natural. Exactly. It's something you either have and you're able exactly. to do. Exactly. Yeah. You, you know, my husband said it. Now, he's trained as a classical musician, but he trained and went into jazz and learned from the jazz musicians. And, you know, he learned from African musicians. And, you know, he's, he's great. He'll talk about jazz in a way that you'd actually think he was black. Because he said there is no, you cannot, you can't make this stuff up. He said you you have to feel it, and if you're not feeling it, and it's not naturally there for you, then you're having to struggle to find that natural way of playing those notes. And it's a voice. Your your, exactly. your improvisation becomes your voice. So in many ways, as a for a musician, I understand it. And I've always said the same to dance. In fact, I said it to my dancers the other week. What last week? When I hear a, mu a jazz musician play and they play within their group and there's a quartet and they're all playing their instruments, but they're all having a conversation through their instruments. Yeah. We need to be able to do the same as dancers. Now, of course, we have to set stuff up and we have to place it and there's a technique and everything. But then we have to get rid of the fear. That is your, oh, am I good enough? Da, 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 da. No, 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 no. You need to find that your your technique is so good that you can throw it away. Exactly. So yeah. that then you can step into the dance and be the dance, not the dance be you, but you be the dance. Mm. And it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to do. And it's a difficult thing to, it's a difficult place to find if you're feared up. Mm. And it's about fear. Jazz is fearless. Mm. It's about being fearless. But but you really, when you look at jazz musicians playing together, you would really think they're at a party on their own, you know, and and you just want to be there. You want to. You do. You know. you do. And and I, but I can imagine also for a dancer because they're much more self-aware when they're dancing. So it it it's what a what a great thing it is if you can. Get rid of that, isn't it? But it goes back to what we were talking about right at the beginning about this rigidity of yeah. what we're supposed to be. And that is the beautiful thing. You know, jazz dance, if it's taught and it's understood correctly, correctly, is the most freest art form in dance. But yet it's the most structured. You need to know the structure. You need to know your technique. You need to know who you are and your ability. You know, I often say to my dancers, the more you give me of you, the more I can create on you. Because then I'm creating for you. Oh, yeah. And this is, we, we're so, you know, most dancers are taught, do it my way. I'm not asking a dancer to do it my way. I'm saying, do it your way. Show me who you are. And I will grab the best of you and turn that into something beautiful. That's the difference. You know, if you look at ballet, it's a set way. You have to do it like this. Da, 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 da. In contemporary, I don't know, that's another story, contemporary. But, yeah, jazz, yeah. but jazz is, you know, for me, it's about looking at the individual and saying, okay, what's your expression? How can I work with that? What can I take from that? And how can I make that into creativity and dance? And there we go. Of course, I want you to learn what I'm doing. There's my set. There is set choreography and it is set. But within that set, is the freedom to be yourself. And that is the difference. That is the difference between a jazz dancer and a classical dancer or a contemporary dancer. And, and on top of that, rhythm, syncopation, know your music, know your rhythm. You know, I always say to my dancers, when we start rehearsals, here's the music, listen to it. You need to know it inside out, back to front, because at any point I might go, bam, we're turning on a dime here. You know, and so for me, it's really for me, I often say to my students who I teach jazz, you have to have your oral capacity the same level as your dance technique, because the two go together. Without the music, there is no dance in jazz. So your oral capacity has to be as high up there as your technical dance capacity. You know, and it's a difficult because lots of dancers don't listen to music. They only do the steps, but they don't really listen to the music. And it's the music yeah. that we dance to. But, you know, it comes to that point where you, uh, that I sometimes uh, thought about, if you if you say to somebody, say, two plus two, that's four. That's, you know it, and it's there can't be another way. But if you say to somebody, design something, 
and and they have to think from somewhere and and yeah. it's not there's no rule and there's no this has to be it's like this and it's, it's difficult <laughs> it's difficult so i can imagine for a dancer who who are used to doing things precise and and or try to do things precise when you say that it's it must but, be no sorry to jump in but it's quite interesting you say that because often men, when you say to a dancer improvise mm -hmm. They don't know how to improvise and they come up with stuff. And I go, but what have you learned? What's the technique that you've been learning from? All your improvisation. I always say to people, I have a stock. It's like a bag full of what I call my tricks. And they stay with me and I can add to that or I can deplete from that. But I have my stock stuff that I know is going to come out at any time. I often, Petra, don't. When I'm teaching sometimes in a class, especially in my open classes, I don't know. I, all I know is the music. I do not know what I'm going to do when I work. I do not work. No, I don't work anything out before I go in. I do Because that is the surprise for me. That's keeping me at the top of my game as a jazz artist to be able to go in and go, okay, that's my music. I know my music. That's what I'm saying about the music. What have I got in my goodie bag that I can throw into that and make, And that it becomes, then it becomes tangible. It becomes real. It's not box standard. I'm not taking from some, I'm not copying. I'm being unique in that moment. I'm being expressive in that moment. And for me, that's exciting because I don't know what's going to come out. And that's what jazz is about. That's what jazz, that's what the musicians do. The musicians pick up, the, pick up their instrument and they play what they feel at that moment. It's about being in the moment. And I think we either have to be somewhere else or we have to be ahead of ourselves. But no, we're never in the moment. Be in the moment. That's the most exciting moment. You know? Dolly, is it is it possible for anybody to, to do jazz, jazz dancing? Or can you already spot somebody and you think, okay, this person is not going to get it? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if they, it, yeah, because yeah, you know, I can see a really good dancer. I know it for me. It's a personality. It's the personality. Okay. Yeah, for me, it's a personality. You know, many dancers audition for Bop and they don't get through because mm -hmm. they don't have an open personality. Mm -hmm. They're trying too hard to be perfect. I'm not naturally looking for anyone that's perfect. I'm not perfect. So why would I want a perfect dancer? That's mm. not mold. You can't mold a perfect person. You can. <laughs> I yeah. want. I want personality. I want a wish to be open and go. Okay, what can you throw at me that I'm going to try? I want excitement. I want. Yeah. All those things that make us excellent, not perfect, because there's no such thing as perfect. There's no <laughs> such thing as perfect, but there is reaching for your excellence. In the moment, which jazz is, it's about being in the moment. Tomorrow's too late to think about it. You see what I'm saying? Five, six, seven, eight. And so for me, there's a lot of dancers who were trained to be perfect. But what is perfection? If we're perfect, then we've got nothing to learn. There's no way to go. There's no growth to be done. The, and I often say this in to all my students at the high level at, at universities down to the normal kid who goes to normal dancing school. Perfection does not exist. Excellence, striving to be find our excellence is important, but striving to be perfect is a waste of time because there's no such thing as perfect. Nothing is perfect in this world. Yeah. In, and I think that's down to the teachers that teach them. And I think that's down to the systems that we have to work within, that we're told that we have to be a certain way, otherwise we're not going to get it. Well, that's rubbish. It's absolutely rubbish because I can have the most technical person in front of me, but who has no soul whatsoever. Oh, yeah. But I can work with somebody who has less technique, who is open to learn, who is open, has a personality that is playable with, who eventually will get their technique down, you know, and I take apprentices in the company like that. I will take apprentices who are not quite there with their technique, but they have the roughness about them that I can go, okay, we can work together. I can get you there. And they work and they get there. Technically they get there. 
So then they're kind of ahead of the people who are technical already because I have okay. to I have to break that technique down to mm. say, okay, who are you behind that technique? And then often find mm, not much there because mm. they've just become machines. But do you, do you need uh, to have the ballet background, or is is it really you go for the jazz technique and that's it? For me, because I'm classically trained, technique there has to be that essence of that, a yeah. there has to be the essence of a decent technique because with a decent technique, whether it comes from ballet, whether it comes from contemporary, whatever, without that technique. It's really difficult for lines, for placement, for agility oh, of the yeah. body. So, you know, for me, my work is really technical. So you can't just come in and be a, a free, a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Freestyle. If you're oh, yeah. a freestyle dancer, it's not going to work for me because there's specifics that I need you to know. You know, you know, I always try and make people go, okay, walk, walk, pas de bore, double pirouette, walk, walk. Now, if you can do that in rhythm and you can do that aesthetically right and you can do that in time and you've got style when you do that, then we can work together. But if you can't walk in time, walk, walk, pas de bore, double pirouette, not in a ballet pirouette, in a jazz pirouette, which is through the plie. And I will say that I want it in the plie and you don't hear that, then that means you don't understand technique. <laughs> you're, not uh, listening. you're not listening. Yeah. You're not it's about listening because at the end of the day if you're listening to what I'm asking you to do that means you're going to listen to the music it's I I am no I'm not fussy what I am is I'm clear about what I want you know what you want yeah but yeah. that's what I also always think is um there's a difference between somebody who is is um who knows what they want and somebody who's just all over the place. And it's easier to know if you work with somebody who knows what they want, because then you know, then it's clear, then it's there. I was taught by Americans. Generally, over my career, I went to America in the 90s, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And I was taught by people who have become my patrons now, George Faison, Louis Johnson, Diane McIntyre, Ron Brown, you know, Thea Barnes, who's now passed, um, uh, Diane McIntyre. I, I, I mean, taught by like the cream of the black jazzers and the black artists. And so there was no messing around. Mm -hmm. And you didn't, you know, you didn't answer back. You didn't, you just went, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> and you just took it and you were like, oh my God, they're going to clean me. And they did, they did. But you, it, what it taught me was resilience. What it taught me is don't faff around, get on with the job because we don't have time you know, when I'm in my, you know, and what I realized from these creatives is that when they're creating, you don't get in their way. You let them create, you pick it up and you make them see what it is they're trying to create. And mm -hmm. I've learned that way. It's not an English way. It's not, mm -hmm. it is not the English way. And so a lot of people say to me, God, you're really tough. You're really hard. I said, but do you want it? Do you want it? Exactly. Because there's yeah. thousands of us. There's thousands of us. Mm. And even more now, even more kids are coming out of college wanting to have these careers. And I'm afraid to say, you know, I'm looking at a lot of students today going, I don't know where you're going to go. I don't know what you're going to do because you don't have the resilience. You don't have the fight. You don't have the, you know, it's like, oh. Yeah. And I'm prepared for a lot of students. I'm just, you know, I am working with students that I'm like, you can't cry every five minutes. You can't go and run into the corner or run out of the room. What is that? And mm. I know that a lot of things have gone on, but I'm of an old school is that, you know, you get hard, you get tough, you get, come on, you know, because the industry is not going to wait for you. Yeah. It's but just it's, not going to wait for you, you know. But it's true that you're saying, and it's this resilience that, that's been built from from the, um, you know, having to overcome these obstacles and, and getting on with it. And, you know, like you say, not cry every five minutes, but just think, okay, what's the next thing I can do or, or, or how can I, you know, get over this hurdle? Uh, and that seems to be something that's, 
I might be wrong, but some people are spared, you know, that things happen too easy and then you lose that, you lose that uh, resilience. I, you know, things come too I, easy. I, I hear what you're saying and I'm of the same thinking and it's not, you know, it's not, you know, it sounds like I care. I don't care. Of course I care. Mm. I care about anyone's feelings because I would be the same. But we are in a culture at the moment where social media has allowed young people to believe they can be famous, influencers, da 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 da, da and they wow. can have it whenever they want it. We didn't have that when we were coming through. We Absolutely. did not have we didn't have that. It was the reality. Mm. It was reality when we came through. And you know, I know times have changed, and this is when I feel like I sound very old. Is that oh, I do the same thing? Oh, <laughs> I was born in 1964, oh God, so, so, so I know. And I speak to my son who's 37, and he goes, and I say to him, Do I sound old? He's yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm at that end bit, mum, you know, and I go. But it's scary. I don't yeah. get it. I don't get this. I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> and I, you know, they want their 15 minutes of fame. My niece, who was 13, I remember my niece at 13 said, I said to her, well, what do you want to do? Oh, I'm going to be an influencer. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. You know, it's like the world has changed, and I understand that. But, you know, picking up your phone and making, uh, 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 making yourself look amazing for – whatever followers that you want isn't going to give you a career that is long standing, you know, and I, again, I say this, do you want short or long short, do the phone, do all the face things, do whatever, but that's short lived. That's your 15 minutes of fame. But if you want longevity, you have to take the phone away and you have to really look at yourself and do the hard work and do the hard work, you know. And it's not going to come to you just because you want it. You know, how exactly. often I hear students say to me, but I'm paying for it. Well, I paid for it as well, but I had to work too. It's not a given that you're going to have. It's not a given, you know, I, and I do say it a lot, 99% or 90% of students that go to college do not make it through. It's 10%. It's literally 10%. And that's still a lot because there's a lot of people doing it. But it's that amount. It's 10%. 1% make it to the top, 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 top. So what is what are you what are you going to do to make sure that you're in that ten percent? Yeah, and they get scared of hearing that because it's that's the reality. But somebody's feeding them, and I dare say, and I do say, it's the performing arts colleges, it's the universities who tell them, "Come in, we're going to make you famous. We're going to give you everything you need. Give us your money." Mm -hmm. And they walk out and they've got a debt because they've been in, you know, they've got a debt for three years of paying into the system of their education. Bad, poor education that's been given to them by teachers who have probably been in those positions far too long. And I believe me, I know that because I work with people like that who've been there far too long, who should not be in that job, who are past the past the sale by date, who are not giving these young people the reality and the perspective of what they need. And then these students go out and realize they can't get the job because you haven't done all the stuff that you need to do. And one of those is being resilient. One of those exactly. is understanding no is a no, but it doesn't mean no forever. What do you, what does no mean to you? I remember I used to say, to myself, well, okay, somebody says no to me, it means either I'm not right for the job, so I've got to go and do something to fix myself, to make myself right, or no, most of the time for me, it's because of the colour of my skin, which I knew, so I was cool with that. Yeah. You know, I was absolutely cool with that. I know I'm not going to get that because I'm not, I'm black. Mm. And actually, they're looking for white dancers, or they're looking for this, or they're looking for, but I knew, but I always knew that I was good enough because I'd done the work to be good enough. So it wasn't my talent. Yeah. It wasn't my talent. It wasn't anything to do with my talent. It was other things. Now it's about talent. Are you actually talented enough to get it? You know, you, you see many artists, uh, actors and actors saying, who was it I was reading the other day? Oh, my God, she just won an Oscar a couple of years ago. Olivia Coleman. 
And she was saying that she went for audition after audition after audition after and got no, 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 no. Look at her now. You know, Olivia Colman, she's huge and she's won her Oscars and she took her doesn't happen overnight and I think young people today expect it to happen as soon as they walk out of college and that just 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 not going to be like that some of us get that some of us are lucky we can do that but not everybody I was one I was lucky I was working before I even left college I had my equity card I had everything but I worked for it I worked really really hard and that was a mantra my father always reminded me of you're going to have to be three times better than everybody else so if you want to do this, work hard, work really hard. Exactly. Mm. And I also believe that, you know, we all bloom at different times. In a, Absolutely. So Absolutely. For somebody, it happens early. For somebody, it happens later, you know. So, um, and, and it's that. But uh, this is also part of why I'm doing these interviews, because you, I hear, um, I mean, I've been talking to over 700 people already, but and all of them have the same story, well, mostly the same story in the sense that, um, well, different stories, but the, the, the theme yeah. is that they started at a young age and work through it, you know, and some of them just, uh, they just kept going because this is what they wanted to do and this determination and this self-motivation just kept them going. And it's so wonderful to hear, and it's wonderful this honesty, you know, people saying, look, you know, this wasn't easy for me, because I think we live in a time where people think everything happens like this, because it's very oh, instant. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we see it like that. We see it. But yeah. it's quite interesting. Again, you should say that, because a lot of people say to me, oh, but it's all right for you. You, It's easy for you. No, it has not been easy for me. You know, I haven't always had this energy. There are times when I am a mess and I'm sitting down going, oh, my God, I can't. Even up to yeah. last week, going, I'm feeling so down and not knowing why, because this isn't happening and this isn't. But I have to pick up myself and I have to go, OK, exactly. ooh, OK, 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 OK. That's that. That was yesterday. Dot. OK, what are you going to do about that today? It, it's a constant. It's a constant. It's not something you can just pick up when you want it. If you want to do this, because as I said to you at the beginning, it's it's a constant creative thing that as you're a self-employed or creative artist, you are you can't sit on your hands. You have to get up and you have to make things exactly. happen. And that only happens. You know, I'm not waiting for anybody to give me my work. I've never really done that. I've always created my own work mm -hmm. because I always knew that if somebody else wasn't going to give it to me, how was I going to get it? Like I say, yeah. the company, no one gave me Bop. I created Bop. No one gave me my career. I went out and I worked it. Nobody told me to go to America. I went to America because I needed to understand what jazz was. I also needed to understand that I was black and I needed to be trained by black people, mm. which I wasn't getting in, 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 in the UK, you know, unless they came from America and I happened to oh, find yeah. And I, I, I clung to them, which I did. You know, there were so many things that I've had to do to create the life or the career that I have today. And I still don't, you know, people say, wow, you're still doing it. Yeah. I got asked the other day, you still, do you still dance, Dolly? And I go, I dance every time I walk into a studio because I show it. Oh, yeah. I still show it. Mm -hmm. And then once I've shown it, I may not show it three or four times now. I've got it down to one or two times, mm. but I still show it. So that means I am still dancing because I need people to see what it should be like. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, then, and then top me some, you know, mm. top me. Make sure you, you do it better than me because my, you know, again, it's, you know, my time for, you know, showing off is done. I'm about... Yeah. Passing it on, pass it on, pass it on. And all I'm trying to do now is pass it on. And I've been passing it on forever. You know, even when I was young, when I was in, um, you know, uh, secondary school, my father bought me a tape recorder for Christmas and I was seven, eight and nine. And I used to go into the playground at uh, uh, the break times and lunchtime and put that cassette player on and play my music and make everybody dance. Really? Oh, yes. That's so oh, yes. sweet. And, and, but this is a real story. This is like, mm. this is how Dolly started. 
So I've not really changed. I've been doing this my whole entire life since the age of four and a half. I have not changed. I'm 62 this year. I don't want to stop. I have no intentions of stopping. The only reason I'm going to stop is when I die. Yeah. You know I mean? And you will, you will you live know, forever, darling. And I really want to go out doing what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be, you know, I love what it is. It's given me my life. It has allowed me to travel the world, meet amazing people, uh, have do super, super, super work. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. I would not trade that for anything. And everything that I ever wanted and everything that I've ever dreamt and everything I've ever put my mind to, yeah, I've gone ahead and I've done it. And to the, to the, you know, I've pissed a lot of people off, excuse my French, and I've made people angry because, oh, she's done it. And I still get that today. I still have that going on with me today. And even this morning I had to sit and I said to my husband, gosh, they can't even be bothered to like my post because it makes them so angry. Yeah, yeah. It can't, they, can't, yeah. they can't even go well done congratulations dinner because it makes them so angry and this is still going on that's why i hate i have to use social media we all have to use it but at the same time i hate it so much yeah but it's um you know i read that uh seth godin the marketer in america he said uh you always have to think that what you're doing is not for everyone and I think about that, you know, I think about it this way. If um, I, I recently had a strange comment on one of the videos and I just, I ignore these things because I think to myself, I'm putting it out in the universe. Whoever wants to listen to it, you well, know, there's no it. pressure. You know? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. There, is that. yeah. there is that. And I, and I do believe in that. And I do think like that. But you do know that there are those people who are there just to, Slap yeah. down. They just yeah. they they don't want to be happy for you. They don't want to see that you're doing this for the greater good, not for your. No, it's not for exactly. me. It's for the greater good. No. We're, I'm pushing the jazz arm forward, and I'm opening the door, and I'm blah blah. blah you know, and it's like, wow, God, can you be so nasty? Because I'm not yeah. a nasty person. I'm for mm -hmm. everyone, and I believe every there's space for everyone. Exactly. I yeah. so believe that there is space. We all have an opportunity here to do good and great and support one another and show each other off and whatever, whatever, you know. I'm and just... Yeah, and and I can also sense that your intention is like that, you know, that you, you don't, you, you're not driven because you want to push people aside. You're driven because you want to do good. I, I... That's kind of my downfall. I think that's probably the thing that probably upsets me the most is people don't understand my intention. Mm. And I get very upset. And I've had that along the way and I've given people things and I don't expect anything back. But boy, you know, when it's turned on its face and it's thrown back at you and you think, wow, I never gave yeah. it to you to do that. And, and, and that has come through dancers as well who have come through the company. We've given them their career and they still bitch you down. And I'm like, wow, wow. What? Because I said not good enough right now. We need to step uh, for whatever reasons, you know. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've often said to people, you know, my bark is worse than my bite. You know, I I bite people just to remind you, come on, come on. Yeah. I'm barking at you. It's because you need to really listen to what mm -hmm. I'm saying. But everything I is coming from love. Bottom line is everything I try to do, and I really believe this, and I, I'm not just saying that, I do it from love. Mm -hmm. And also I do it because I have it so I can give it. Exactly. it, it, it I mean, and that isn't being big headed or anything. That's, you know, somebody once said to me, you have so much energy, Don, you always give so much because I've got it. So I want to give it. It's, is that okay? Can I not do that? Can I not give my energy in that way or give my love or give my gift of whatever I have? I can give it to you because I have it. I have enough to give you, you know. And I sometimes think people don't get that because a lot of people are selfish. Yeah. And the thing is also you you had a lot of no's and you had to overcome that. And you actually sometimes, oh, I, I, yeah. I sometimes think a no is sometimes a big favor that somebody gives you because, you know, it's not that it's not the path that you're supposed to go. So uh, 
you know, I think that's also sometimes misunderstood. I think it is misunderstood. You know, I've known that in the past, you know, yeah, I think it is misunderstood because, you know, a lot of people just think it's been easy and I've got it all. But no, like mm -hmm. I said earlier, it's been really tough. And if I, if it was tough for me, then it's going to be tough for other people. I, my job is to try and fix that. I don't want it to be tough for you. I want it to be yeah. a little bit easier, but you're going to have to do this. So I'm I'm somebody who will tell you to support you, not to pull you down, because yeah. I know what it's like to be pulled down. Mm -hmm. So I won't do that to somebody else, Because, but I will give you my opinion. If you ask me for my opinion, I'll give you my opinion, and I'll yeah. be totally honest with you I do, uh, Dolly we, uh, you and I would get along very well because <laughs> my my children always says to me <laughs> the same thing you know that um uh, sometimes when you give an opinion my daughter asks me something and I give an opinion and she said that's a little harsh and I said well you ask <laughs> my son says the same but he said you know what mum you know, I wouldn't have it anyway. I don't know you any other way. And he said, you know, <laughs> I am a product of you and I have learned from you that honesty is the best way exactly. forward yeah. and be straight and open. And he said, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't change you for anything. And I'm like, okay, if my son's saying that, then yeah. I must <laughs> But Dolly, you've but you've had this wonderful acknowledgement uh, MBE. I know. And sorry, I'm a year late, but uh, so congratulations for that. It yeah. must have been yeah. such a great day, and and having received that, and such a great honor. I was so shocked, really, because I, I wasn't. Nothing in my head told me that this would this this I did not know was coming. Mm. This I really did not know. Funny, my husband said, oh, yeah, one day you'll get an MBE, doll. You Really? And I said, oh, no, absolutely not. No way. No way. And then I remember because it was the letter came in 2022, and I thought it was a tax letter. I thought it was a because it was a government letter with the government sign on it, and I was like, oh, God, that's tax. That's my tax. And, yeah. and I kind of laughed and threw it across the room, and Paul Paul picked, my husband picked it up and he opened it. He went, you know what, doll? You're going to laugh. And I said, why? And he said, you've been awarded an MBA. I said, oh, oh I get this I one. don't know, I swore and I, I, and then he showed it to me and he said, look. He said, Amazing. You've been awarded. And I was like, what? Yeah. And I was in shock. I was in shock. It I took about imagine. a month for me to resonate with it. And then all the thoughts came is, okay. What does this actually mean? How am I going to explain to people? A lot of people ask me, particularly black people, are you going to accept it? And I went, well, yeah, of course yeah. I'm going to accept it. I'm yeah. going to accept it because somebody thought or people thought to nominate me as somebody to receive it. So it, it's, it's not a simple thing. Yeah. You are nominated by whoever. You are checked. It goes to the government. It then goes to the queen you were really checked to see if you are this person and you should receive it because they can denounce you it as well. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. So there's a whole protocol that it has to go through before you get the letter mm. and then you have to accept it. So I accepted it and then I was like, wow. And I know a lot of people have said because of, you know, the colonialism of the word empire and all that, oh, I'm not going to take it because I'm black and da, da, da. And I went, that's not my story. Exactly. That's yeah. not my story. My story was as I was born here. Everything I've done has been from my Britishness mm. as a black British first Wonderful. generation mm. born here doing this. And I said, you know, how many black women have danced? Get it? Mm. You know, certainly nobody from jazz gets it. Mm. So that's number two. And third, you know, too many people have nominated me for this. And it's it's a it's exactly. a gift. I'm not, I'm not going to denounce that no. and, and disrespect the people that have thought that I should receive this. I have no idea who they are. So I put that in my little thing that I thank the people that have nominated me for this. But it was we had such a wonderful day. And I went with my husband and I, you know, bought two dresses and three hats. And I was like, oh, wow. no, it was great. It was great. It was a lovely day. Prince William was charming. We had the most wonderful conversation. We chatted like Billy O and, 
Yeah, I remember. Really? Yeah, he was great. Yeah. And he said, oh, my daughter, Charlotte, dances. And I went, ah, oh, but, but she doesn't do jazz. And yeah. they, I remember they were playing It Don't Mean a Thing, but like on a uh, um, classical style. Yeah. And I laughed. And he said, oh, I expected you to dance up. I said, don't tempt me. <laughs> don't tempt me. I said I had thought about it when I was standing waiting. Should I should I kind of dance and part of Borea? And um, that's how our conversation oh, started. Yeah. And Amazing. We, yeah, we and were just chatting, chatting. It, it was lovely. It was a lovely day. It was a really it's, good it's, day. You your your outlook on it is so positive and and that's why you are where you are, you know, because you 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 see what it's what it's all about. Time. Yeah, it's an honor for me to receive some like It's course. a real honor. It's mm. a it's um it's a statement to say you have done this doll. You have your your services to dance. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I've done sixty years of this. Okay, fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, I I have put in. I have put in. So yeah. Okay. I, it's right that I receive something. I did not expect to receive that at all. Amazing. So that was the beautiful surprise of it all. And I'm, I'm honoured. I was I'm honoured and humble. And, you know, I'm not going to denounce something that has been given to me. I am British. Mm. I'm not going to deny that. I My parents may be from the Caribbean, but I'm not. I was born here. and I put exactly. everything I've done into this country. And it's been from that state that I've worked mm. from. You know, when I go to anywhere in the world, I, I am British. You know, exactly. <laughs> just like and the thing is, you know, sometimes you don't. Uh, I mean, I come from a country with also with a with a um, uh, bad history, <laughs> but I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be um, sort of uh, judged by that because I wasn't part of it. You know, so that's what I said. That's exactly yeah. So so I you know sometimes people delve into. I would say what what you did by delving into the history of the jazz and and where it comes from that's so beautiful you know and that's the beautiful part and that's that's showing the beautiful part of it but some people keep dwelling in the in the negatives of the history and and for me you know negativity we can carry that around and we can have layers of that and we can bring that from our ancestors and we can bring that from our parents and we can bring that does it get us anywhere? Not really. You no. know, in the history books, if you want to know the truth, it's there. It's there. Go find it. But it, I wasn't part of that. I understand it. I feel it. I exactly. can connect to it. But I'm trying to change it. Absolutely. Yeah. My job is to change that perception. Mm -hmm. My job is to look at it in a different way and go, okay, that happened. How mm -hmm. do we make sure it doesn't happen again? Yeah. And, you know, that little girl there in England, seeing you there, receiving that award, thinking, hey, I can that's do this. me I in can, a few years' yeah, time. Yeah. I, I can do this. And that is exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly. So yeah. we are representing who we want to be and who others can be. Absolutely. You know, for me, that's my role. My role is not to step back into the past and say, okay, okay, take me away. Yeah, yeah. I, I, know, I, know, I know I never did that. You know, any racism... <laughs> truly any racism of course I'm going to fire back and I'm going to slap it out of the yeah. way and I'm always yeah. doing that my parents taught me to do that you mm -hmm. either say nothing and you lift your head and you walk on by or you speak it but make sure when you speak you speak with articulation you know what you're talking about blah, 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 blah. and that's what I do and I still do that today you know as an EDI as a a, a diversity consultant and advisor I have to do that in meetings so I'm constantly saying, no, we're not doing it like that because that was then. We're doing yeah. it like this now and we need to change. We need to be brave. We need to stop talking about it from that point of view and look at it from that point of view. That's my job. I can't change who I am. I can't change the colour of my skin. I don't want to. Yeah. I really don't want to. I love who I am. I love who, what I look like. I love everything about me. I love my history and my, my, um, my heritage. I love all of that. But what I want to do is lift it. Yeah, I don't want to keep bringing it down. Absolutely. So, well, yeah. that's that just shows your lovely energy. It's so <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> oh, Dolly, I hope I meet you in person one day. I hope so too. Really, I want to give where, you a big hug. What part of where are you? Where Where are you? I'm in Austria. I'm in Vienna. You're in Vienna. Yeah. Where am I there? I am in Linz in April. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm in Linz in April because I'm judging. I'm part of the Dance World Cup judging. Oh, wow. Uh, so I'm judging the qualifiers in Linz in April the 13th, 12th and 13th. So, yeah, I love Austria. My first ever professional, one of my first ever coming out of college, well, I was still at college at Lanes, was in Austria. I toured Austria. Really? Yeah, I had the best time ever and I ate lots of chocolate. Oh I had lots of good chocolate. That's what I do. <laughs> lots of good chocolate. No, I love Austria. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. But, um, Dolly, you've done so much now and, and uh, so so many wonderful things. But do you, what is the wish for you for the future still? Uh, just to allow jazz to have its place like classical dance, contemporary dance, for it to be seen and and be able to be shared in a way that is not controversial, but in a way that says it's a high art. I That's what I want. I want jazz to be seen as a high art. I also want to be healthy enough to continue doing what I'm doing. I want the next generation to grab life with all hands and all feet and run with it in a good, positive way. Yeah, I, yeah, I want... Yeah, I could go as far as saying I want all wars to stop, but I don't think that's going to happen because we have a lot of silly men in charge of our world. Exactly, so yeah. It's going to happen. <laughs> but, uh, you know, let artists do what we can to serve that purpose. And, yeah, for me, it's really about just keeping the, the name of the jazz art form alive and kicking and, and making it as uh, accessible for many to watch, but also more so for many to do, you know. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think also uh, if if young people could be, a, you know, are able to get the exposure or or you know get uh, in schools get the opportunity to dance, how wonderful that would that be? And well, I think especially as long, jazz, you know. Because yeah, no, I think as long as we're doing what we're doing, and we're changing the landscape as we do it, you know, I think if we yeah. can keep changing the landscape as we do it and keep talking about it in a positive and progressive way, then it will happen. We're not going to be able to bring everybody with us doing what we do. Yeah. But if we, I always say, if I've turned somebody's head, even if it's one person, that's one person more than nobody. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, no, for me, that's true. To, to, to keep educating and to keep sharing the art and creativity from the earliest point to the oldest point, uh, then we're 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 doing right. We're doing good. We're doing good. Fantastic. But thank you so much, jo Dolly, for your time and your lovely well, living pleasure. room where we are visiting at the moment. Coffee <laughs> <laughs> and and I yeah, I've really been lovely talking to you. It's been a lovely conversation actually. We haven't we didn't stop. Yeah, I know. It's like we know each other. You know, it's, yeah, wonderful. No, we'll, we'll definitely... Very familiar. Towards the end of his life, Miles was hailed as one of the true geniuses of jazz. Miles was at his enigmatic best when describing his creative journey and legacy. Because for him, he was simply being Miles Dewey Davis III. I mean, the way I change music and stuff. Yeah, you can say that. Because I do change it, but I can't help it. Jazz is just like a, an attitude.
Not that I'm a genius, but it's just that I can't help it.